Thank you very much for coming to this um, brief talk on how not to stay data or the 10 rules for obscuring your message. Now this is a condensed version of a one day course that I give. So it is going to be a very quick gallop and it's only going to touch the surface. But um, I shall just briefly go through what I think are the important messages. So first of all, let's ask ourselves what do we want to display, well, how do we want to display data? What are the reasons? What is of course data exploration? So you get data set and you can explore it, you do a few tables and you, do some, you draw some graphs. And they don't have to be perfect, they're just for exploring your data. Then it's one to describing it, tabulating it. And the final one, which is the one that I want to concentrate on, is on communication. I mean, at the end of the day, we all do lots of research, or we present data, and what essentially we want to do is communicate a message. To, to people, whether it's we want to communicate a message about the number of students we've got coming in this year compared to last year, or in terms of our research itself. It's all about communication, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Okay. So the first rule is um, for, for obscuring your message is to use 3D when 2D would do. And it, this is that quite a common one, particularly as some of the defaults in people things like Excel, if you do a bar chart, I think the default is a 3D chart. That extra dimension is completely unnecessary. The thing with a lot of, like, with bar charts and pie charts is that the area of display is supposed to reflect the volume, the, you know, the, the amount that you're trying to display. So the moment you turn it into a volume, it, it, you, you kind of lose that relationship. So this is a um, rather glorious example from Nature last year. Is it last year? maybe two years ago, two years ago now, but it's not an isolated example. This I found on a very quick first crawl. Um, so what they're looking at is the categorization of a gene um, and the proportion of the genes with different functional information. I mean, what, the good thing that they've done is they've actually put the percentages here and they've kind of ordered by size from 1% to 2 to 3. But it, it's very hard to know that um, some of these are that's 2 and that's 5%, it, you, you're totally losing the relationship. Um, so 34%, it's very hard to see, and it's in colour. I mean, it's, it is one of those gee whiz graphs that everybody loves. But it's completely... The 3D element doesn't add anything to your understanding. It makes it very hard to read. So rule number two is to use colour or pattern appropriately. So if we go back to this other glorious example, the colour Whilst it looks great on the page, it's not adding anything to the information that you're receiving. In fact, it, it costs a lot to print colour pictures, and the moment you want to photocopy this, or somebody downloads the paper and wants to print it out in a black and white printer, they lose all of that colour information. So it's just not worth it. Plus, I think, I mean, I've looked at figures for um, colour blindness. There's between about, between 8 and 12% of the population are colour blind. So, so that additional information between red and green is completely wasted on them. And, and there's, there's a thing with, with um, I think dyslexic students really struggle with colour as well. They like their information printed on different coloured paper because it helps you with black and white. Sort of. So just avoid colour if you can. It's not necessary. But it, it is. So this, I redrew this. I redrew this. And I sent it to Nature and said, this is so much better way to display the information that you're showing. And um, they just wrote it back and said, get lost, we're not interested. Nobody <laughs> replies about it, but... So I've just ordered by size, I've just... You can see much more clearly what the relationship is between the different categories and how they link. Very, very simple. Not as exciting, not as like, gee whiz, but much clearer exposition of your data. So, they obscured the information, but you can just add in lots of distracting additions. Now, this is from a few years ago now. This table shows the economic ward activity in Sheffield for different districts, so Arbuthorn, that Beachy from Green Hill all the way down to sort of Woodhouse, all did alphabetically. I'll come to that in a minute. And what they're doing is they've got all the economically active and all the economically inactive people, and they've got the percentages in each category. And what's not immediately obvious to people when you see this table is this, this all column is the sum of not all of these, because the total, this total, is some of these two columns. <clears throat> but this all column is the sum of this column and this column, I think, and possibly the full-time students. So these time at the break, it's just a lot of additional information. It's just not necessary here that you can work out. And then you've got the economically inactive as well. 
So you just include loads of additional information. It's not necessary. I mean, you don't need to put... I would argue if you really want to parse out here in percentage signs. As long as you're saying that it's percentages at the top. Okay. <clears throat> and then ignore the intrinsic ordering in the data. Now, with that data, page up, it's ordered sort of alphabetically, so that a, a local council can say nether edge can go to nether edge. What they can't make out from this table is how nether edge compares. They can't do any comparisons. They have to start analysing the data and thinking if they want to do that. So if you reorder it, so there, there we go. Now, I mean, it, it, it's still quite hard to read, but I've got rid of the percentage signs, for example. I've ordered it by percentage economically active, the smallest to highest. So although you have to work a bit hard to find out where nether edge is, you can just scan down it, you can see it there. You can see where you are much more clearly relative to all of the other areas of Sheffield. And when I, when I see tables like, like that one, personally, I lose the will to live and I'm a statistician. So goodness knows how people who are not statisticians who don't actually love numbers feel about things like this when you're trying to communicate that message to them. And what I did was, the columns which are kind of subsidiary columns are greyed out. The information's still there, but it's less prominent. So you know, <clears throat> not a lot of it's made of this greying out of columns either, which I think is quite a good way of including information, but not giving it as much prominence. So um, this is again ordering by stuff. These are ordered alphabetically. It's the population in millions of 20 European countries ordered alphabetically. Quite hard again to see whether has Belgium got more citizens than the Czech Republic or more than Greece, more than Hungary? Difficult to say. So let's reorder it. Much clearer there. Order by size if you can. If there's no intrinsic ordering, if we're talking about um, you know, if you, if something's it's just don't, don't do it. But if you've got an intrinsic ordering like age, retain that ordering. But if there's no ordering like that, but you want to see how things rank, do them in order. So use an inappropriate scale. Now, this shows the MMR vaccination rates from 1990 to 2007. Um, the, line, the, horizontal, the vertical line here is the point at which Andrew Wakefield published his paper in The Lancet. Now, obviously the government had, over sort of 10, 15, 20 years has had quite a big campaign to get MMR vaccination rates up to above the level of herd immunity. And then sort of Andrew Wakefield comes along and publishes this case report on 11, at that number, 11 patients, was it 12? And suddenly nobody's getting, well it looks like suddenly nobody's getting their child vaccinated. Now, it was quite a dramatic fall, and it, this graph that you've got the scale, it makes it look very dramatic. If you give the whole percentage scale, it doesn't look quite so dramatic, but it's still, you can still see that it's below the level of herd immunity. So if you want to exaggerate a, a something, change the scale of it. And then, just to show that people are still getting their children vaccinated, not for MMR, there we add in the diphtheria, which has been more or less level over this period. And it's, it's starting to come back up now, the MMR vaccination rate. But you can make something look much more dramatic, change the scale. So, so then rule number six is you make the scale hard to read. So, and it, this is a very sort of fascinating example. You've got um, type, some course of time of delivery for all new mothers, it's data from a study that Alicia did, uh, published in the BMJ in 2002. And, and you sort of, I mean, you can still read the scale, but it's, it's not as clear. If you just reorient, turn it round, it's going. Now, all of these are little tricks, and I, I've, I've done a very simple example, but often, if you have to sort of start turning your head, it makes, it just makes, it's another barrier to people and saying what's going on. So we change the scale. And then use pictograms inappropriate to represent quantities. So here we go. This is one looking at average earnings. So although doctors in training and their equipment apparently do earn twice as much as sort of qualified nurses and midwives, twice as much, it looks like it's four times as much because of the, the scale of the pictogram. And that's, this is one that's really favoured by um, sort of newspapers. They love these sort of scaling up pictograms to make information. But it, it does make the differential look much greater than it actually is. So a, a true representation would be to use two mini maps, <laughs> rather than just the one large one. So 
So rule eight, use obscure labels or labels that are unclear. Again, this is a great one. You, you know, you, you, in, in your database, maybe you put in sort of visit one, visit two, visit three, visit four, and you know that visit one is baseline, visit two is three months, visit th four, three is um, six months, and so on. But without, unless you label it properly, people will not know that. Okay. This is a table that appeared in the British Journal, British Central Journal, I think, which is a my poor display. Um, so the beans of eyesight correction, numbers in the tables are actual numbers of respondents. So you've got male, 89 used glasses, four used contact lenses, and one had laser surgery. And for, but it, it's, when, you, when you read the type and table, the means of eyesight correction, you, initially you think, you, we're talking about an average here, an arithmetic mean, not the type of eyesight correction method used, which would be a clearer title. So again, I'll read you it. But I put it into percentages this time. So I've got the numbers 94 males and 41 females. So you can immediately see when you're looking at, and the, and in the table it contains percentages. So you can see quite clearly that men, on the whole, 95% of men will use glasses compared to 73%. So almost 100%, almost all men compared to three quarters of women. And the different contact lenses and how more women have chosen laser surgery than, than men. So much clearer when you think about, when you label things appropriately. And then rule nine is to use the wrong graph. So <laughs> this is percentage vaccinated. You can actually use full percentage vaccinated. I mean, you can use a bar chart if you want. But it's, sort of, it's quite hard to pick out what's going on from that graph. And it, whereas if, if you plot the trend lines, it's much clearer. In this case, and the other thing with this is it uses a lot of extra ink, which which is unnecessary. Mm. If we're trying to be a green university, we should be trying to cut down the amount of ink. But, um. <clears throat> and then this is again, this is from the British Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery, and it says it's a box of whisker plot, and there's two, there's three visits: visit one, visit two, visit three. Again, we don't know what these visits relate to. This, this scale's not been labelled, so we don't know. We, if you read the title, it says volume up alveolar cleft and bony formation after one year, post some kind of intervention. And it said box and whisker plot showing significant difference between the volumes between these three visits. It's not automatically immediately clear from. So box and whisker plot is probably not the best way to display these data. And I, I don't think displaying the mean differences between the, two, the groups and the 95% confidence intervals. I mean, they're, they're, that's, again, very unnecessary. Even worse. So, but if you put plot the means with the confidence intervals, it becomes a bit clearer to see what the pattern is between them. And then ask yourself, actually, would a table be better? Now, the thing with the question of whether to do a table or a graph is often if you're doing presentations at a conference or in front of people and you've got 10 minutes to get your message across a figure does it much more quickly absorb what's going on it's much clearer whereas the table is probably better for if you want to really scrutinize the data and put it in a, into a report that's not a hard and fast rule it depends upon what you want to do but i don't know about you but how many conference presentations have you sat through when somebody puts up a table with like 15 results and like 25 comparisons. And, and you're sort of there so busy trying to read that table that you lose what the message is that they're trying to give to you. So, um, think about your audience, think about how it's going to show. <clears throat> and rule 10, when all else fails, use a pie chart. Please, I have never in my professional life ever used a pie chart. They're not necessary. This came out, this was a few years ago now, it's about two, 18 months ago. <laughs> and it was obviously compiled by somebody that didn't really understand what they were doing. And what they've done is, they'd ask people about how, um, do, do you, just kind of looking at approval ratings, do you approve of Huckabee, do you approve of Palin, do you approve of Romney? So 70% said they approved of Palin. 63% is also said they approved you know, Huckabee. And um, so it, was, it weren't mutually exclusive categories for starters. And then um, they sort of displayed it in this chart without really realising that it's supposed to add up to 100%. <laughs> or if you're going to display this sort of data, 
another method might have been better. I mean, it looks fantastic. But as soon as this was produced on, on Fox News, somebody sort of quickly downloaded it and it just sort of spread through the web. Everybody was just like, laughing about it. It was hilarious because it's so cool. Well, just wrong. Um, so coming back, really, I mean, I don't know what I'm doing for time. I race through it. So just think again about what we want to do, use data for. Think about when you're communicating, what your message is. I mean, I, what I always advise people is that when you, when you look at your tables, think, is it clear? You look at your graph, is it clear? Is it, is it, is it um, giving my message? And it, go back and refine it and think about it. Because although, although we are so focused on getting our message out there, the, thing, the area that I think we, we neglect the most and it's a very, what is that area of how we communicate the numbers? It is the methods that we use to communicate the numbers, communicate our message. And I think we really need to think very carefully about it because we, a, a very, very well, a well-drawn table, a well-drawn graph can, can give a message so much more clearly. And you don't want your readers to sort of have to sort of search for your data, search for the information. If you think about when you go to conferences and or you go to poster presentations, you sort of, you know you're walking past all these posters. And if the one's full of really badly drawn graphs or really badly presented tables, you don't stop at it, do you? Spend your time figuring out what is going on, unless it, you are really, really interested in the topic. Most of the time you carry on walking until you get to the one that looks great. And you stop it and you look at that one. And that's the one that you stop and look at, unless it is really of interest to your particular area of research. So think about how you're going to hook people in. The useful question is what do you want to show, what methods are available, is the method chosen the best, would another have been better? And then final thoughts, think about your audience. Decide what you want to present, are you presenting results, are you presenting data, are you presenting what, what's, what is it you want to say to people? As I said, tables are really good for quantification, charts are good for illustrating specific points. And this is the only pie chart that I have at any time for. <laughs> Which isn't my, but I wish I'd never drawn it. And we are going to put these uh, slides up on the web, so there are a few resources. Oh, yeah, but plenty of time saving for Christmas. This is kind of a hobby horse of mine. <laughs> so, are there any questions? I'll stop there. That, that is like a condensed one day course. There's so much more that I could give you if I have the time. I have one. I'm not an academic, so I don't produce posters for conferences. But if I was walking around looking at posters, I'd stop at the colourful ones, mm. not the ones in black and white. I think it, it varies depending on what, what message you want to get across, but you have to think about it in terms of the, the audience that you're gearing it towards. I mean, sometimes, yeah, I, I agree, you might stop at the colourful ones, but if, if it's, still, it's really badly displayed, you, you, you wouldn't stop very long. No, you, I mean, there's, are, are there differences between if you're circulating information, then it has to be easily photocopied. But if you're doing something for a poster or even for a, a presentation and you've got it on PowerPoint, it is instantly more interesting if it's in colour. It is, but it's always quite hard to read, I think. And I think if people are spending so long trying to read it, then they're not concentrating on what you're saying to them. But, I mean, I'm not saying don't use colour. Use it judiciously. No. I mean, if you look at the posters behind us, I mean, obviously, the one with all the colour maps looks great. I would concede that. But I think you need to be very careful in your use of colour. I mean, the, the government, I mean, local councils have this traffic light system, you know, if something's getting bad, it's green, red, and if it's getting better, it's amber, and then they have green, so tables are coded red, green, amber. But 10% of people can't understand that table. They can't pick up on the colour message. That's not really necessary. So, and I'm, I know that they've had a few sort of internal debates at Sheffield City Council about that. <laughs> Where's going, I don't know. But, um, does that answer your question? Well, it's not really a right or wrong answer, to be honest. I think it's very different in the poster. We have trouble with the um, coffee collaborations with your manager. Yeah. Then, then you want it's got a uh, quality assessment, a bit of diagnostic stuff, and that brings you up in you know, a nice little table and so things coated red, yellow, and green. Of yeah. course, you print them out to send them tonight. You've lost that. It's very difficult to tell the difference between the and back. And I would argue, if, if they had a tab where you could turn it sort of light grey, mid grey, yeah. dark grey, that would at least okay, allow you to photocopy it and allow you to send that information to other people, and it would allow people access to it who can't read. Yeah. And because it, you know, it's fine on the screen, assuming you're not yeah. But, you know, once you try So, to I mean, I would argue just use shading. Shading is mm -hmm. a quite powerful way of picking out things. Well, it's a sort of table.
say display that we would have done with, you know, a tick across and a question mark. Yes, exactly. And then we could, we could read it, it might not catch the eye. Too. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.